hiding out in the barn where we store stuff and park the buses lately, um, but it was in dire need of some attention, <laughs> and, uh, and they gave it that attention, and things are much better organized out there and uh, put together and cleaned up, so thank you guys. Some of them are here this morning. We appreciate your hard work, and uh, I know you probably kicked up some dust. Um, I didn't do near as much work as you all did yesterday, but I kicked up some dust at home. That's why I have a little bit of a frog in my throat right now. But, uh, but thank you all for doing that. We appreciate it, and uh, it was very much needed. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so uh, this week, as we're moving through this series that um, is working, that working through the catechism, and we now come to uh, questions uh, 25 and 26, which, which are about the Word of God, and... Uh, we're asking the question, what are the scriptures? What is God's word? Or what are the scriptures? And the answer is God's word. But, but and there, there's a, the, the short answer to the question, what are the scriptures? Is the, the books of the, or yeah, what are the scriptures? The, the books of the Old and New Testament as the, has been generally accepted by the church for um, a couple thousand years now. Um, but, to put it more in, um, in, in more relevant language, I think, um, I think we can begin to get at that question when we ask the question that many of us uh, parents have asked along the way in our journey as parents is, or, or not really so much a question as much of an as a exasperated uh, um, uh, exclamation, which is, I wish kids came with an instruction manual. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, if you've got kids, you've said the same thing. Um, I know I have a time or two, and uh, as, uh, as we've aged and our kids now are becoming adults and have moved out, uh, well, not all of them have moved out, but, um, but they've become adults, and at least according to the, elite, the legal definition, uh, but there's still some influence we wield in their lives, and uh, we still want that instruction manual. Um, and the good news is that life didn't come completely without instructions, did it? I mean, I've kind of set the stage and made the obvious response to that, well, that we do have an instruction manual known as the Bible, but it's so much more than that. It, it can't be reduced to an instruction manual. Um, that really doesn't do God's Word justice. I mean, sure, there are principles for daily living, including raising kids, but it also contains real illustrations. God's Word contains real illustrations of what happens when we follow God's will versus what happens when we don't, when we go astray from it. It's the story of a God who loves his creation, <clears throat> but gave the crown piece of his creation the ability to choose. That's us. Knowing that we would make the wrong decisions. And therefore, God also crafted the perfect way for his children to be redeemed. For them to, once they're set free from the shackles of sin, be able to freely choose him. It's a story of, of God redeeming his people, pursuing his people. And God's word is a part of an ongoing conversation that we have with him. And, and it contains meaning upon layered meaning so that when we come back to it repeatedly we can still drink deeply from the well of fresh truth. You might even say that since I mentioned that it's like drinking from the well you might even say it's more like breathing than drinking as it is intended by God for us to get into daily as a part of the rhythm of our lives. I heard that put really well in one of my devotionals from this week that, you know, I listened to J.D. Walt's uh, daily wake-up call. And he wasn't specifically talking about just Scripture, but he was talking about devotional practices, which, of course, include regular pursuit of Scripture, where he said, yesterday's breath isn't enough for today's heartbeat. <laughs> Let's put it a little bit differently. Okay. Heart, I know you want more oxygen, but I breathed yesterday. That'll be enough for now. No, that's not going to work, is it? 
So the encouragement then, therefore, is for us to get into God's word daily, to breathe deeply of what God has breathed into scripture. And today's scripture reading that I'm about to get to contains not only a word about the nature of scripture itself and that breath of God going into scripture, but it also shows us what the potential results are from straying from that word. So I want to read to you from Paul's letter to Timothy, the second letter to Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. And the apostle writes, and God says through him, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women. And since I read that inclusively, I think it can also capture weak men. And not just into the household, but into all areas of our life. Let me go back to what Paul was writing, though. Burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning, yet never able to arrive at the knowledge of truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. Let me stop there again for a moment, recognizing that Paul has pointed out to Timothy the potential dangers of going astray from God's will as revealed in his word. But then he talks about what it looks like to stay within God's will. You, however, he continues, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. My persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, and Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So that's some words about the nature of God's word and, and uh, some of the dangers from walking astray from it, as well as what it looks like to be within God's character and will. But how is it that we know that the Bible we read today, the the books, the scrolls, the collection of works of the Old Testament or Hebrew Scriptures, and the New Testament is God's Word? How do we know that it's reliable? How do we know that it really is the revealed Word and will of God? Critics would say, and have said, and do say, that it was put together by a bunch of old guys who wanted to use it to control the world and benefit themselves. And that you can't trust anything that was passed down at any point by oral tradition or through the process of copying copies that were made from copies, made from copies, etc. Particularly when the ones from which those copies were copied were then destroyed or discarded. Some have likened it to a game that I remember playing in youth group when they were telling us to avoid gossip. And, and for the gossip game or telephone, you kind of have a line of people and one person whispers very quietly into the ear of the first person a, a message, a word, a sentence, something like that. And then that gets repeated to the next person and the next person all the way on down the line until they get to the end. And then that person says it out loud for everybody to hear. And it's kind of a comical exercise because usually by the time it gets to that last person, it's been so completely distorted and changed that it bears no resemblance to the original word that was given at the other end of the line. If 
But I think when you really think about what oral tradition was in, in the copying of God's Word by scribes, it's more like telling the same story over and over again in the midst of a large group of people, a community that tends to correct the mistakes when perhaps the person that taught the person to recite the story is still there in their midst, and then everybody who has heard the story before has the ability to correct an error that is made. And then, of course, as someone who believes in an almighty, everlasting, omniscient God, one would think that God would work out his own guidance and correction in the process. One classic example is the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, a kid out in the wilderness, uh, minding the flock of his family, throwing rocks, because, you know, that's what kids do, pick up rocks and throw them. And here's the crash of ceramics in a cave, and he goes to investigate, and he finds a collection of ancient writings that predate um, that predated Christ. Much of them having been writings from what we now what what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. That when scholars examined them, were almost identical in content to what is preserved in the writings that have survived to this day, aside from them. And then there's the process of canonization that happened within the Christian community just a couple hundred years after the, the, uh, um, the actual happenings of the Gospels and, and the, the writings of the Apostles. Um, instead of a council deciding, in, you know, 325 AD for the rest of the church what God's word was going to be it was really more like the church as a whole had already recognized that a certain set of writings letters and scrolls that were being passed around from church to church as God's word with very little variation the churches the individual churches agreed on what those were uh, and and it, until people began to seek to enter new books into that panoply of scripture which were not consistent with the others. So the councils of the church simply affirmed with those individual churches that existed at that time pretty much already agreed on with a few minor differences. And all of this happens, that council at Nicaea, just a couple of hundred years after those who could remember the events themselves had passed away. And while that, <clears throat> to say a couple hundred years may seem like a long time, let me put it this way. I'm in my 50s, and I'm old enough to remember the year that Vietnam ended. Now, I don't remember it as that year, but I do remember 1975. And I was born in 71, so I know hostilities actually had ceased before that, uh, but that's when the accords were signed, right? Not only that, um, but there are those in this very congregation who and remember vividly the experiences of that war. They can attest to the fact that it really happened. Okay, so we're talking about events in the range of 50 or so years ago, and I'm not the oldest guy in the room, right? I mean, I'm not going to point anybody out, but, but I'm not the oldest guy in the room. And then when I think about this, my mother remembers World War II, and I believe her when she tells me about her experiences of what that was like on the home front. Now, she doesn't, she was a child and she lived here in the United States, so she doesn't, she has no experience of the combat that happened or anything like that, but she can, she will often tell stories about how she remembers what rationing of shoe leather meant for her, that she had to go around barefoot a lot of the time. And she also says she, you know, has vivid memories of hating the appearance on the roadways of military vehicles, just despising them. They frightened her. She herself was babysat by an aunt who could remember the time of the American Civil War. Yes, this was someone who was an older woman in her age, but her aunt could remember that. Now, that's 158 years ago. The last apostle is believed to have died around 100 A.D., 
around the end of the apostolic age. When that's what we consider the end of the apostolic age. The Council of Nicaea was only 225 years later than that. Not too many generations separated. So by way of comparison, from where we stand today, that's like looking back to remember, it's close, to remember the American Revolution. Okay, none of us alive were there to see it, but we know it's a well-attested event of history. A series of events of history. And besides all of that, if the Bible was crafted, this, this collection of documents, in order to control a populace, it's not a very good document to do that, or set of documents. There are way too many things in it that lift up things like equality, seeing women as partners and equals with men rather than as property. The treating of someone who had been a runaway slave and had broken that law and had all manner of penalties that would, would have been likely visited upon him for someone to write a letter contained in these books that says he is now your brother. Treat him as such. Then his property. The welcoming of the stranger. Seeing people of other nations as good neighbors. In fact, Jesus himself lifting up a foreigner from another land who was much hated by the people he was talking to. Lifting that one up as the good neighbor, the Samaritan. The loving of enemies and praying for those who persecute you. And viewing yourself as a citizen of a kingdom that transcends the nations, the kingdoms and tribes of this earth. In fact, authoritarian regimes have a tendency to ban this book and to severely restrict the activities of the organization, the church, who recognize this as God's word. But putting all of that aside, in my own journey, when I realized that I had had to come to my own decision regarding the authority of the scripture, the Bible, the Old and New Testaments, I realized that these 66 books documents, scrolls, written by something like 40 different authors over the course of thousands of years are remarkably consistent in theme and purpose as the story of a God seeking to redeem his people and transform creation, restoring it to its original creation. It appeared particularly remarkable to me when I compared it to other holy books of other religions. I could go on and on all day about these apologetic defenses of the Christian faith in terms of God's word, but I'm not going to. <laughs> We've only got so much time this morning. But I did hear just this past week that Lee Strobel, the author of The Case, of Christ, Case for Christ, is coming to the Highland Lakes area in February, and unfortunately it looks like it's going to be the same weekend that I've got to be at annual conference. But I want to encourage the rest of you all, if you you want more information, if you want to hear about someone who sought to disprove the faith coming to faith in Christ, it, I, I highly recommend listening to Lee Strobel. So let me finally get to my first point this morning. <laughs> we recognize the Bible as God's word in this church, in our denomination. This is an issue that is considered already settled for us in the Global Methodist Church. It is to us the ultimate rule of faith and guidance and the religious of, of the rule and guidance of faith and of the, the life of the religious community. It's intended to shine light onto the dark paths of our lives as we walk through this darkened world. Psalm 119, verses 130 and 131 say, The unfolding of your words give light. It imparts understanding to the simple. Let me stop there and say, I'm personally grateful for that. <laughs> I open my mouth, he continues, I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Did you catch that? I open my mouth and pant as though there's a thirst that needs to be quenched. The word of God is not only light unto a dark path, it is water for a thirsty soul. It is bread for the hungry one. When the Holy Spirit is present in someone earnestly seeking truth, they find that which satisfies their hunger and thirst. The world has gotten so dark, and there's so much spiritual hunger and thirst. 
I mean, friends, turn on the news. But not for too long. Because it's dark out there. I mean, we hear about Israel's at war again. Ukraine and Russia are still at war. Conflicts are threatening to become even larger. And then we just take a look at our own political situation in this world where the polarization just keeps ramping up. I mean, if you're like me, wherever you are on this political spectrum, you know they all need Jesus. There's so much hunger and thirst in this world. That's why there's been spontaneous revivals breaking out among the generations that we in the church have failed to reach. And not just in places like Asbury, a Christian college, but in places like Texas A&M, not only the one in College Station, but also in Corpus Christi and Galveston. Baylor, I mean, yeah, they're a Christian college, but LSU, Louisiana State University, Indiana Wesleyan, where's Wesley? Lee University in Cleveland, Tennessee, mass baptisms at Auburn University. And I think the list is, is growing. I mean, what bothers me most about that list is why did A&M and OU have to beat UT to, UT to the revivals? <laughs> Sorry, I'm still limping from yesterday's game. <laughs> Maybe when it happens at UT, it'll be bigger and better, right? <laughs> But you know, we lifelong Christians, we shy away sometimes from sharing the Christian faith with, with others because we're, we're afraid. We, we, we're afraid to talk about God's Word because we, we think that not only is the Word going to be rejected, but we're going to be rejected along with it. And what we're coming to find is that people are so hungry and thirsty in the world today, particularly among the young that people who have been starved for the Word of God and been fed nothing but spiritual junk food just find themselves only too happy to come to the feast table of the gospel. It's like the Apostle Paul wrote to Rome in chapter 1, verse 16, when he was talking about the gospel. He said, it's the very power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, regardless of whether they're Jew or Gentile. The power of God unto salvation. So second, I want to say the Bible has all we need to be saved. And you don't need special, super secret knowledge, just an earnest desire for truth in the presence of the Holy Spirit. It, I mean, that's number five of the Articles of Religion. For both the United Methodist Church and the Global Methodist Church, the Holy Scripture containeth all things necessary for salvation, so that whatsoever is not read therein, nor may be proved thereby is not to be required of any man that it should be believed as an article of faith or be thought requisite or necessary for salvation. In the name of the Holy Scripture, we do understand those canonical books of the Old and New Testament of whose authority was never of any doubt in the church. And then that article goes on to list the books of the Bible that are considered God's Word. In other words, if it's not a scriptural doctrine... If it's not based in God's word, it's not something that's going to get you saved, according to our understanding as followers of Jesus. Or here's how Paul said it in Romans. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Whatever was written in the former days, and he's primarily talking about the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, whatever was written in former, formal days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Because this world can get so dark. We need that hope. And I've already mentioned this about the Holy Spirit, which you heard about last week in Debbie's message, but it bears repeating and a little bit more explanation of the relationship of that with Scripture. And so third and finally, I want to say the Holy Spirit enables us to understand Scripture. The Holy Spirit enables us to understand the Bible. First, it was the Holy Spirit that enabled writers of what we now recognize as God's Word to be able to faithfully pass on to others what God wanted us to know. It wasn't because they were great people. They were sinners like you and me being redeemed by God. And so we believe that it was something that was specially gifted to them through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me go back to our reading for this morning in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is 
breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped in every good work. And if the Holy Spirit is God, and I believe the Holy Spirit is God, God's not going to contradict himself. He's not going to reveal something to you or to anyone else that con- conflicts with what he's already nailed down in Scripture. So that being said, the Holy Spirit will give you the ability supernaturally to know how God's revealed will applies specifically to your life. And it will also reveal some supernatural giftings that you're being given if you're open to it. And you can read more about that by looking up the gifts of the Spirit. And I don't want to get into that because we're already running way short of time. Here's the main point for this morning. God's Word is alive, active, and it's understandable, and it's not something that we should take lightly. Let me say that last part again. It's not something we should take like lightly. I mean, I get it. It's, it's fun sometimes to sit down and look at Scripture and, and kind of, you know, speak highly speculatively about what we find therein, but... But really when it comes down to it, we have to remember that what we're dealing with is God's revealed word to us and to the entire church. And so we don't want to deal lightly with it. We don't want to be too dismissive of any part of it. I know sometimes I like to skip through places like Leviticus (laughs) with endless lists of laws. But I also remember one time when I was challenged to do a study on Leviticus, and I really began to discover the depth of how everything in that book pointed forward to Jesus. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6 says, Every word of God proves true. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found to be a liar. And in Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, I consider both of these two little passages to be kind of like God stamping a copyright on his work. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, and I would add not, well, I say I would add, I'm reading about not adding to God's word, but I I think this applies to the entirety of Scripture. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and the holy city which are described in this book. You know, I don't want to miss out on that tree of life or the restored holy city, particularly when I consider what's going on in the holy city right now. And when I consider what's going on in the world right now, I, I want to I be able to, to, to go, to run to that tree whose leaves are for the healing of the nation. Because Lord, we are broken. And we need healing. So, here's what I want to challenge you with today. I want to invite you to pray over this. How can you make the Word of God more central in your life? Whether you're someone who is just beginning the discipline of cracking open the Bible, or whether you're someone who reads the Scripture faithfully every day and has a reading plan. How can you move it a little more to the center? Take some time to pray. Father, we give you thanks and praise for this great gift of your word to us. Lord, we thank you that it doesn't take super special secret knowledge or a fancy degree to understand the basics of your word. Even as we're grateful, Lord, for those who have taken the time and made the effort to study more deeply. And Lord, we all, I pray that we all want to move more deeply into your word consider it more fully to let it apply more deeply in our lives and Lord in the middle of this broken world so much darkness all around 
so much pain and suffering, so much evil that we do one to another. I pray, Lord, for your peace to break out. We look forward to that day, Lord Jesus, when you will come back in person and restore things. But Lord, you are here in person in each of us now, and we are agents of your kingdom. So let us not restrain in any case, at any time or any situation from doing exactly what you call us to do, from, from doing exactly what you're doing in us in any given moment, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, come. In these things we pray to you, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that even as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In a moment, we're going to sing a song that invites God's word to speak more deeply into our lives. And our time of worship together is drawing to a close. But if you desire to remain for a moment longer in the presence of God, today here in the sanctuary, you are certainly welcome to do so you would like someone to pray with you, please let us know. I'll be here. Karen will be here. Some of the rest of us will be hanging around just a little bit. And if you want somebody to pray with you, maybe you're seeking healing or you want to break free from something or you want to pray with each other, you don't have to stay, but you also don't have to leave. You're welcome here. I invite you now to stand as you're able.